What's up, Generation Church? How we doing? So good to see you guys again today, this weekend. Merry Christmas, as we're in the middle of the Christmas season. And uh, we had so much fun last week doing the message together, yeah. we thought, let's do it again. Yeah, why not? And, um, <laughs> So just want to take a moment and welcome all of those that are new to the family. Uh, we're so glad that you guys are here. We know you're not here by accident, those watching online and in the house. And uh, so we're excited to get to know you. And we just wanted to, to say welcome home. And uh, I hope that um, as you connect here that um, God just does something special in you and your family. And, um, and so today we're going to continue our series called A Very Cancelled Christmas. And Christmas is not canceled, but there are some things that, um, that try to fight against us in this Christmas season that try to cancel our faith. And um, I just think it's important for us to take some time as we're celebrating the birth of Jesus that we don't allow those forces to, to get in, into our hearts and into our minds and, and really mess up this, this season. You know, so we, we get into these places of like stress and anxiety. How many of you guys get stressed at Christmas time? How many of y'all are too stressed to even raise your hand? <laughs> stress and anxiety. Um, you know, sometimes we get into uh, materialism and over-commercialized Christmas. And I was amazed this, this year. I was like, Halloween is here. And then Christmas was the next day. I was like, we're, we're not even doing Thanksgiving. We just go right into selling stuff for Christmas. Um, but uh, conflict and chaos, we talked about that. Uh, but then also one of the, the things that tries to cancel our Christmas is doubt. Doubt and depression and, and disbelief. And you know, I, I don't know where you are, but I know a lot of people find themselves in this Christmas season, uh, which is supposed to be a season of belief, uh, really doubting some things. Yeah. Uh, really kind of, I don't know if it's the extra time off that we get, kind of getting introspective, but we start to evaluate maybe some of the things that didn't happen the way we wanted them to, to happen in, in our lives. And, and, and so we start to have some doubts. And, um, you know, the thing about Christmas is, is faith is paramount. I mean, the whole season is about believing that God sent his only son and, um, and he died on a cross for us to save our souls. And if we miss the, the faith that is um, generated in the Christmas season, then it, it does something in our, our overall faith. So you're not alone in this. You know, a lot of people feel this way. And if we go back to scripture, we actually see in the book of Luke chapter one that Zacharias and Elizabeth, um, who are the parents of John the Baptist, they also had some doubts. They had some struggles and they had some things that didn't happen the way that they wanted them to. And if you're new to church, you may not know this. So I'll give you a little bit of the backstory and then Melissa will read the, the verses to us. But uh, Zacharias was a priest. He was a man of God and they were old in age, well beyond childbearing years. And they'd never had a child and they believed God for a kid, but it never had, had happened. And if you can imagine how they must have felt like, God, we've been serving you faithfully. All of these years, we've been giving our lives to the service of you and to your people, and, and we don't have a child yet. There, there must have been some places in, in them where they were beginning to doubt God's faithfulness. And so Zacharias shows up to the temple to do his typical priestly schedule, and while he's there, the archangel Gabriel shows up, and that's where Melissa picks it up. All right, so here we are. We're going to read Luke chapter 1, verses 11 through 20. It's a little bit long, but hang in there with me. It says, while Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. 
You know, what I find amazing about this passage of Scripture is when God finally showed up to answer their prayers and started to move on his behalf, he had doubt. Yeah. Uh, but what's even more interesting is Gabriel, the archangel, he canceled Zacharias' doubt by, by muting him. How many guys would like to have that power over your spouse? <laughs> like, I mute you. You're muted. <laughs> um, and... Uh, Right Listening n- ear, yeah. <laughs> right now, if I'm, you know, you know. I'm being muted. <laughs> Listening ears. Uh, watch last week's service, ladies, and you'll. Uh, it's helpful. Yes, it'll be helpful. The, the a. M., nine a.m. So, so Gabriel saw Zacharias in this moment of doubt. Like this is the first, you know, thing that's beginning to happen. Like as we celebrate Christmas, this is germane to the story. This is very important to the story. And, and so Zacharias is beginning to doubt God's faithfulness. And so Gabriel comes in, he's like, no, 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 no. We're not going to go there. You've been praying for this your entire life. God's got a big plan here. And so we're just going to zip it up for you, Zacharias, until the child is, is born. And I, I think this holiday season, it's a good lesson for us because there might be some things that are coming out of our mouths that are canceling our faith. Yeah. That, that are, are contrary to what God is, is trying to do in, in your life. And so today we want to give you some, some tips from the scripture that I think will, will help you to cancel doubt and to cultivate your faith. And, you know, one, one of the things that um, I think is important is we do have to remember what God has done in our lives. Yeah. Th- this idea, if you want to just write this word down or, or um, just put it in your, your memory, that, that we have to remember what God has done. Yeah. And Zacharias and Elizabeth, of all their years, you know God had done some things in their life, some miracles in their life. But when they got to the point where the one thing that they'd been praying for is about to happen, I'm not sure that he remembered what God has done. And I think that's true for us. Like you might be in a place where you're believing God for something right now and you're having a hard time with it. Uh, but have you taken the time to look back and to say, hey, you know, we, we struggled with infertility for seven years. God was faithful then. He gave us Hudson. As a matter of fact, we had so much faith for Hudson that Ethan just showed up on his own. <laughs> so now we have, we have two, two wonderful kids. But, you know, I, just so you know, like I struggle, Melissa and I struggle with these things. You know, back a f- uh, couple months ago, we were doing a series on, um, on finances. And, you know, I, I vulnerably shared with you guys, like we, we gave an offering to First Care. I had one number. Melissa had one that was 10 times the amount. And... <laughs> And so obviously we went with hers because it was more spiritual and, and, uh, and, and, you know, at the same time, I'm thinking we were going to finish our run commitment and then our AC unit started having issues. So I called the AC company and they're like, yeah, it's no longer under warranty. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like $5,000 to fix this thing. And I'm like, Lord, I need you to help. And I, I honestly, like I was a little stressed by the whole thing. And, um, it, but I, I have to go back and, and look and remember that God has done so many great things in, in our lives. And so I decided to call the company. And guess what? The guy got it wrong. It's under warranty. And so I was stressed about all that a couple of months ago and all the money that we had to pay and all of that. But God is still faithful. And I just wonder how many of you are out there believing God for something and you're building this case. You're saying these words that are cultivating doubt instead of cultivating your faith. You know, I think, I think that's so good because, you know, if, if you think about what you think about for a minute, um, it's so often that we remember or we rehearse the bad things. You know, we rehearse the negative scenarios. We invent um, conversations with people that, that, that haven't even happened, probably will never happen, around negative topics. And it's actually difficult um, to remember, there's something wrong with my stool today. And um, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've noticed. And I've tried to be cool, but um, it's, it's not working. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Um, the Lord has answered my prayer. He's supernaturally making me talk. Taller than <laughs> Melissa. There's something about it that's called yeah, like this. It's just hi everybody over here. Um, <laughs> um, our brain is actually hardwired toward the negative, and um, so often Genesis through really through the Psalms, often God. Um, 
reminds the people of Israel to remember his blessings, to remember the miracles, to tell them to their children. And, and for parents out there, when is the last time that you sat down with your, um, with your kids, maybe even your adult kids, and, and you said, you know, before you were born or when you were really little, I was going through this struggle. I was going through this difficult thing. And this is when I really met God. I want to take a minute and remember um, um, when, you know, I didn't know how we were going to make it. I didn't know what was going to happen. But, but, but if it weren't for God, if it weren't for, for that moment um, where God came through and he showed up on our behalf, like we, I don't know what would have happened. And, um, and I, I just think that's such a critical and important part of our faith. And it's not just something that Ben and Melissa are here talking about this morning. It's something that's, that's really in Deuteronomy. It's in Psalms. It's in so many places in scripture where God calls us to remember. So we're going to have four things for you to remember that will cultivate your faith and, and cancel your doubt. And, you know, just setting up the last little part of this, as we think about this Christmas season and, and what Zacharias and Elizabeth were, were going through back in that moment when Jesus was about to come, you know, God had been silent for 400 years. Yeah. And maybe you feel like God's silent to you today. But if you look at the original Christmas story, God may have been silent for 400 years, but he was not inactive. Yeah, that's good. And you may not be hearing much from him in your situation right now, but that doesn't mean that he's not moving. Yeah. It doesn't mean that he's not active. He, he was setting up so, so much, and we're going to unpack some of that uh, today. So maybe your lack of an answer and the things that you're believing God for is not his unwillingness, Maybe it's just that he's orchestrating a larger picture that you just don't see yet. You know, and I, I think it can be hard to remember that when we get disappointed. You know, when we, when we feel the pain or the sting of disappointment that, you know, we've, we've done all the right things. Anybody ever been in a situation in life where you, you did everything right? Like legitimately, not, you know, like joking, like I think I'm so right. Like you legitimately did everything you could possibly do. And as far as you can tell, you did it the right way. And it still didn't turn out the way that you wanted it to or the way you needed it to or the way you hoped it would. Anybody? Yeah? yeah. Just some nods. Yes, that is unfortunately life. There is disappointment in this life that comes um, sometimes based on the negative choices that we make and, and sometimes in spite of the positive choices that we make. And, um, and, and you know, Zechariah was living in this state of, of, of disappointment. He was living in a place where um, the promise had not been fulfilled. They were advanced in years. It really seemed impossible. And, and so we hear his disappointment and he's like, listen, Listen, I know that you're like this spiritual angelic giant being that's standing right here in front of me, but how is this going to happen? Like this is, you know, I, I just, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding because the pain of disappointment was greater than the faith um, that he had for the promise to come to pass. And so our first point this weekend is this, um, when things, when you're in disappointment, when you're having a hard time remembering um, who God is and who he has been in your life, you've got to remember that he knows more than we do. He knows more than we do. The scripture tells us in Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. It's talking about the Lord. My, nor, are my ways, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Um, you know, when Zachary, Rias, and Elizabeth were worried about having a child, they were just hoping to conceive and have a child. But, but God wasn't working just to give them a child. He was working on a, on a specific child, a special child that had a, had a moment in history when they were supposed to appear, when they were supposed to, to, to be part of, of what was happening in the spiritual landscape of the world. And you have to remember, guys, that God knows something that you don't know. When it comes to faith, if you're not there and, and you think that what you, the knowledge you possess, your perspective on your situation, your perspective on the world, if you, th if you are limited inside of that, it's almost a non-starter to believe that God can do all the promises that he says in the scripture. You have to believe that he knows something you don't, that, he's, that his, his thoughts are higher, his ways are greater, and that he's got something better. Yeah. yeah. How many of you guys have kids? 
Okay, and how many times do your kids tell you something that they absolutely think that they know, but you know that they don't know. They have no idea what they're talking about. They're like, oh yeah, blah, 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 blah. And, and, and you're like, you're four. You are four. And, and you try to explain to them, like, you just don't know. Like, you have no idea what you're talking about. You're four. And sometimes we're that same way with God. Like, we get to this place, you're 44, and you're like, I, I got life by the tail. I figured a few things out. And God is in heaven saying, you know what? You've been writhing around for all these years over this one thing that you're praying about that hasn't happened like you wanted it to happen, but I'm working on a larger plan. You've been wanting this child, but it's not just any child. I'm bringing John the Baptist, the one who would prepare the way for the Messiah. And by the way, Mary is a little girl right now. She's not even able to have kids. So I I had to wait till she was at least 16 years old before you could have John so that she could have Jesus. Like there were parts and pieces that God had to put into place so that their prayer could come to pass. And he knows more than you do about it. And when you begin to, to, to understand that and believe that and remember that, that maybe it hasn't happened like you wanted it to happen when you wanted it to happen because God is orchestrating something much larger. And, you know, on that really quickly, you know, if anybody um, has ever thought about a child that has too much weight and responsibility, they have a lot of anxiety. And a lot of times the anxiety that we're under is because we're taking on God's weight and responsibility. We're taking on the pressure of what he knows. We're taking on the pressure of, of, of the ability to fix it for ourselves when really that belongs to him. The scripture tells us that um, to cast our cares on him because he cares for us. And he wants to take the weight and the stress and the anxiety and the pressure off of you through the knowledge that he knows more than you do, that he's a loving father, he's a loving parent, um, and he doesn't want you to have doubt. He wants you to cancel doubt with faith, but he also wants to cancel anxiety through um, the, the great love and, and of, of him being such a good father. That he's, he's got you, he's watching you, he's taking care of you every step of the way. The next thing is this point too is that we have to remember that we serve God, he does not serve us. Now this is going to hit hard and it's going to hit home because in our culture, we believe that God is just there to answer all of our prayers and do everything that we want him to do. And God, why didn't you do this? And you should have done that. And why am I not blessed? And why haven't you fixed this? And why is this not healed yet? And da 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 In some ways, we have a, a skewed, uh, an Americanized, Westernized misconception about who serves who. Yeah. He is not here to serve you. And I say that as gently as I can. He is not here to serve here. you. You are here to serve him. So good. So when life doesn't happen the way that you want it to, that's a, a, it's, it's not an issue because you're here to serve him. You are at his behest. He is the creator of heaven and earth. And when he decides to do it in his own time, he'll do it. And if he never decides to do it, then he never decides to do it. But he doesn't serve you, you serve him. And this is a thing that you see with Zacharias that I think is so powerful is if you notice back to the passage, it was when Zacharias was called up to serve for his week in the temple that the angel Gabriel showed up. And I don't think that that's a, a coincidence. That, that there's something there that the scripture is trying to unpack for us, that when our heart gets in the right place, and even though he probably was hurting and, and, and maybe angry or full of doubt or, or maybe even giving up, he didn't stop serving God. And it was when he started to serve God that God turned around and answered the prayer. You know, I find that um, th th this point about, you know, we don't serve, we don't, God doesn't serve us, we serve him is really hit home for me. Um, because, you know, right now in my life, personally, I, I, I feel like I have very little time. I have very little time for things to work out. I'm, I'm constantly trying to move things forward very, very quickly. And, and um, there's no prayer life like a baby and toddler mom prayer life. You know, you're like, God, please help me. God, please help me. God, please help yeah, when me. When they wake up at 445 every day. And, um, and I have found myself um, getting angry. Um, at times when, when I feel like things aren't happening it, through my prayer life at, at the time that I want them to, and not, maybe not permanently angry, maybe not like a lifestyle of anger, but in that moment of like, oh, like can you help me out? Um, I, I need a little help here. Can you see, you know, can you put our children in a deep sleep for the next two hours? <laughs> um, and 
I, uh... <laughs> For our online church family, someone in the crowd just yelled out Benadryl, Benadryl. which Thank is better you. than alcohol for the toddlers. So. Ben, ben, Benadryl, B-E-N. Um, I, and I, I, that's where I, I've noticed in myself where I, I um, flipped the script a little bit, that it's, God is not here for me to order him around. And when things don't happen the way we think and we um, get angry about that. What, what kind of relationship is that? That is a, um, maybe an employee, employer, that is, a, that, that is a relationship that is outside of the understanding, like Ben said, that he is the creator of the universe. He knows more than I do. He is a majestic God who has been so good to me. And, and, and it's then that um, we can really check ourselves and evaluate our heart and go, okay, I've, I've, I've gotten our relationship out of order. I've forgotten who you are and I need to remember um, these things. Yeah. And that comes down to surrender. I mean, honestly, this is probably the, 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 the point of the whole message is, is that we serve him. He doesn't serve us. And, and you don't really get to that place until you figured out how to surrender. And, you know, a, a great place for you to work on your surrender is every January we do prayer and fasting. And man, when you haven't had a cheeseburger in four days and, and you're trying to spend time with the Lord, it's, you, you really figure out how surrendered you are. And, uh, and so I'll just encourage you guys to, to prioritize that, but to surrender your will to God to surrender your plan to God and to understand that you serve him at his behest. The other thing is that we live on his timeline. He does not live on our timeline. Yeah. It's huge. I mean, John could not come any earlier because he could not be who he was supposed to be until Mary was old enough to give birth to Jesus. Like th there was a timeline there and, and Zacharias and Elizabeth had to be okay with God's timeline. And there's a timeline for you at just the right time. God will do what he is supposed to do and what he's promised to do. And part of faith is accepting that we exist in his timeline, not our own. Um, that, that's part of the faith that, that helps cancel doubt is that, um, that I accept, like I accept that I have to surrender. I accept your timeline. I accept that it's not the way that I want it to be. And I believe that you are good and you have something better. Yeah. You know, one other thought under this idea of we serve God, he doesn't serve us is, um, we're here to obey him. It's not the other way around. He's not here to obey us. And, and we saw in, in Luke chapter one, verse six, the, the Bible says that they were careful careful. Zacharias and Elizabeth were careful to obey the Lord. Yeah. And there's something that happens in the cultivation of your faith when you obey God. And honestly, a lot of times God doesn't answer the prayer that you're praying until you have done the obeying that you're supposed to do. Yeah. Um, and, and so there's a, a part of this where we submit our lives and heart to God. And the, the other part about this that I think is, is an important point under this is that uh, we don't design our lives. God designs our life. Mm -hmm. The scripture tells us in Matthew 16, 25, forever desires to save his life will have to lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will actually find it. So a lot of faith in canceling doubt is really just relinquishing control yeah. over to God. That's so good. You know, when you're doing that, um, I, I think a great model of that is in G where Jesus uh, prayed the Lord's Prayer. Um, and the first thing he says is, you know, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done. That's the very first thing he prayed. He wasn't like, hey, God, you know, um, could you help me out with this, this and that? You know what I mean? He, uh, your will be done. That was the posture of Jesus's heart. And so if you're struggling with this, if you're struggling with relinquishing control over outcomes, like Ben was talking about, if you're struggling with faith because you're like, God, like you're not doing anything I say anymore. Like what's going, like, are you even real? Um, if you're there and there's no judgment on that, I've been there. Um, if you're there in your life, then maybe try Jesus' model of prayer. Your will be done. Meaning everything that happens in my life, I trust you. I have given my life to you. 
It now belongs to you. It doesn't belong to me anymore. And because it doesn't belong to me, therefore your will be done. And that's all the while believing that, that he is truly a good, loving, benevolent, compassionate father who knows more than you do. And so, but then we see that we, we in the Lord's prayer, we don't, we, we do get to ask for other things because then Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. And I think we start off so often with like, okay, Jesus, today, here we go. Got this, 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 and this. And by the way, like, if it's your will. Um, and I think we need to reverse that. Um, that your will be done. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And then, God, give me the sustenance for today. And, and you can look back over the day. If you, if you truly have that posture of heart. Sorry, I'm going to try to turn around and look at you guys over here. <laughs> If you truly have that posture of heart um, and you believe that, you've, you've, you've relinquished life to that degree, um, you can look at the end of the day, you can look back over the day and say, you know what, God sustained me today. He gave me my daily bread, the emotional sustenance, the, the physical sustenance, the spiritual sustenance that I needed to get through today. And we can trust him to bring forth his greater will for the rest of our lifetime. Yeah. And, you know, the other side of the coin is, you know, you can get into a place where you're, you're just asking God for his will, but you really aren't giving any faith to it. That's another ditch to this. And, and so when the Bible promises things to us, it's, it's not that it's not God's will. He wouldn't have put it in there if it was not his will. The thing is, is when you're praying for God's will to happen in your life, for those promises to come to pass, you have to be okay with the outcome. And you have to be okay with the timing. And sometimes we can cop out and be like, well, if it's thy will, God, if it's thy will, if it's thy will. And if he's already told you it's his will in the word, then it is. And faith is, is that you're able to stand in alignment with his will, with faith and patience. And that's when you inherit the promise. And so you can't just cop out and say, well, he didn't do it because it wasn't his will. No, faith is I'm going to believe you, just like the, the Bible says in Hebrews 11 for the patriarchs of faith. I'm going to believe you until the day I die. And if it never happens and I never see it happen, it doesn't mean that your word isn't still true. It still is true. Yes. Two quick thoughts on that. Number one, Romans chapter Eight, I think where it talks about all things are working together. Even if something doesn't work out the way you think, he's so good that he's weaving a story still. It's, it's, it's not finished. It's not over. And then um, the next one is, um, remember those guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who went in the fire? They said, we're not going to bow down to you. Our God will save us. But even if he doesn't, yeah. even if he doesn't, we're not going to, we're not going to bow down to you. We're not going to worship you because it, 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 the out, it's not really about the outcome. It's about the trust in God first. Yeah, so good. Okay, the third one is this. We have to remember that faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. I think this is why Gabriel shut the mouth of Zacharias is because uh, what, he was, what people were going to hear him say was not going to build faith. It was going to build doubt. And, and so he shut his mouth, made him mute until the child was born. And so we do have to be cautious about what we say and about what we hear. Uh, what, your doubts that, that come out of your mouth can cancel your faith. And, um, the, and the doubts of people around you can cancel. It's why it's so important to be engaged in, in life groups and, and a part of a faith-filled community uh, and be on Christmas Day, you know, and, 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 and be filled up with, with people who are full of faith, faith that is uh, overflowing and abundant, enough to go around to everybody. In Romans chapter 10 and 17, the scripture tells us, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that is how you cultivate faith. It's how you cancel doubt. It's probably the biggest way that you cancel doubt. Whatever the enemy tries to, to sow into your heart that is doubtful, you combat that with what God says that is truthful. And you keep con uh, confessing and, and saying those words of faith until the doubt is completely gone. That includes reading the scripture on a daily basis, yeah. sowing it into your heart. If you're going through a season of, of incredible doubt, I would encourage you to um, listen to as many sermons and podcasts as possible. Um, hear the word of God over and over and over again. Um, and you might say, well, but then that's gonna take care, that's gonna get rid of my doubt, Melissa. Yes, 
it is going to get rid of your doubt. And I want that. Exactly. Because if you play the movie forward on the alternative, if you walk down the road of doubt, where does that go? Is that going to lead you to a place that you ultimately want to be? Is that going to lead your children to a place um, that, that they need to be decades down the road? Um, you, need to, you need to do what you can to sow faith in your heart today um, so that you live a lifetime of the miracles and stories of God for your children to witness for them to pass on to their own and so on. Yeah. And then the fourth and final one is this, that we have to remember that we walk by faith, not by sight. And it's so easy in our world today to, to get caught up in what you see instead of what God has said. And so we, we walk as believers by faith. That means that you walk through life having not seen the promise yet, still believing in faith, still serving God, still trusting him, understanding that he, he does not serve you, you serve him, understanding that he's working a larger plan in your life. And, and you walk that life out by faith, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And then when everything else is unknown, faith becomes the known quantity yeah. of our life. When you can't see anything happening, when God had been silent for 400 years and, and nobody saw God moving, he was still working. And the only thing that they had for those 400 years was faith, faith that the Messiah was going to come. There was no visual evidence. Yeah. And I just wonder for some of us, when we start to miss the visual evidence, what happens to our faith? It begins to, to crumble. Hebrews 11 once says this, that faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things that we cannot see. Through their faith, people in the days of old earned a good reputation. I just want to say this really quickly. Faith is more like knowledge in your brain. Faith is not a feeling. And having faith does not change your current feelings. You may feel sad, bad, lonely, depressed, anxious, negative. Um, you may have a lot of negative feelings that seem like they're not going to go away. At the same time, you can hold on to the knowledge of faith that God is who he said he is, that he will do what he said he will do, that he will take care of you regardless of how you feel. The more your faith is built through hearing the word of God, the more your feelings will change on a consistent basis. It doesn't happen overnight. It does, it's, not an, it, it's not always instantaneous, although sometimes it is. Um, the scripture tells us that we can put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness and get those feelings out of the way. But, but I just want to encourage you with that, 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 that just because you feel a certain way does not mean you don't have faith. They are very separate, they are very distinct, and it's very important that we distinguish between them and that we hold on to our faith when, when everything we feel is against um, faith. Yeah. So. so this Christmas, our, our encouragement to you is, and wherever you're struggling with faith or wherever you're having doubts, to remember that God knows more than you know. Yeah. He's working something bigger than, than you realize, and, and that... Um, in the midst of that, you still serve him. He, he does not serve you. And so build your faith up, read the word, go, go to church, be faithful at church, get into a group, study the Bible together, and then don't walk by sight, walk by what you know. And what you know is that God has written his word and he's put it in a book that you can read and you can uncover and the Holy Spirit will speak those things to you and you can trust that God's word is true because God's word is his will. And so this Christmas, my encouragement, our encouragement to you is cancel your doubt. Cancel your doubt and cultivate the faith that God has given you. So Can I pray for you today? Bow your heads with me, those of you online and in the house. Father, I just pray for all of us here today. Wherever we are in our walk with you, whatever we're dealing with, whatever we're struggling with, whatever the Christmas season kind of brings up that might be disappointing or painful, Father, I just pray that today that you would lift our eyes, that you would lift our understanding, that God, we would understand that your ways are higher than our ways, that we would acknowledge that and that God, we are your servants first and foremost, and that no matter what the outcome is, God, we will always continue to serve you. So Holy Spirit, I just pray today that you would take the words that we've spoken the scriptures that we've shared and you would plant them in the hearts of your people and that they would grow and they would produce fruit, Father, that they would produce faith, 
that what the people have heard today would increase their faith, would strengthen their belief. God, that they would just begin to, to believe again for things that maybe they had written off or forgotten about or had thought were too difficult or too tough. God, would you, would you just strengthen our faith today? Would you help us, God, to believe for more? Would you help us to believe for things that are miraculous? God, help us to believe for things that, that are outside of the normal of life and society, to believe that we serve the creator of heaven and earth, a supernatural God. And I thank you for it today, Father. Strengthen our faith. In Jesus' name.